Today I want to uh, talk to you about the development of baiting as a method for uh, subterranean termite control. And this is, I'm going to take you through about 50 years of history in, in a very short period of time. Um, we do sell a, a bait at Dow Agri-Sciences for termites and uh, so I have a natural interest in, in the subject and was very enthusiastic to put it together, um, put together that re retrospective. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about Dow AgriSciences um, in a broader sense to this group. So I, I pulled some slides together to describe what Dow AgriSciences does as a company. Um, it's a little bit of a sales pitch, I guess, to the students maybe that are in the room, uh, but to give you an idea of what, uh, what we do in industry. Um, I also wanted to spend just one slide talking about my career path and what we value um, in, in our employees and then of course spend most of the time on the topic at hand which was the, the development of uh, termite bait. So talk about Dow AgriSciences right down the road. Um, anybody from been to the headquarters down in Indianapolis? A few of you, yeah. Well, I'll extend an invitation that if you get a chance to, to come down um, and see what we're doing there. Uh, we've done some tours when ESA was in town and things like that. We do tours periodically. Um, we began in the 1950s as the agricultural uh, unit of the Dow Chemical Company. In 1989, around that time, Dow and Eli Lilly formed a joint venture, which is why we're here instead of in Midland, Michigan. It's just a fact that I'm very grateful for. Um, but the Dow uh, turned the Dow AgriSciences, bought the Eli Lilly interest out um, in uh, 1997, about that time. Um, so now we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the Dow Chemical Company and in our 2012 global sales were about 6.4 billion. Um, we've got that level of sales. Dow Chemical is more like a 57 billion dollar company and so we leverage as much as we can from the Dow Chemical Company as far as infrastructure and manufacturing and things like that. Um, wow, that didn't show up at all. There's a map of the world uh, showing that we do have a lot of sites all across the world. This was a, a question um, that came up in lunch today as to where our, our facilities are actually located. Um, and you can see there we've got facilities in more than, uh, in more than 40 countries. Uh, we've got a total of about 7,800 employees at Dow AgriSciences worldwide. This is sort of our mission statement. You guys are probably aware that by 2050, the world food production has to support an estimated 9 billion people. And that is the, the mission of Dow AgriSciences um, to help feed the growing world. Uh, we're committed to developing sustainable agricultural solutions. So what are some of those solutions? I want to talk about our products a little bit. Uh, we have uh, another question that came up in lunch today. Uh, where do we sell most of our products? And I said mostly in the U.S. Um, so that's the bulk of our, our product line, um, our sales go into the U.S., but also a lot, a lot in the rest of the world. Um, you can see that we have both crop protection um, materials in red here, and that's our sales by business in 2012. And uh, the seeds business is about 21% of the business and growing year on year. Um, we have, I thought it was interesting to show that we have products in both sides, on the biotech side and in the ag chem side. We have a lot of bolt-on seed acquisitions. In that picture that I showed of the world, you'll see a lot of facilities um, uh, of a certain color, I can't remember which color it was, but those were the seed acquisitions. So we have acquired a lot of seed companies in order to have access to that germplasm and access to the market. Um, and we'll talk more about our pipelines in, in just a minute. Let's see. So highlights from last year, 2012, um, our sales were up 13%. Uh, uh, we were, we broke $5 billion in 2011 and six in 2012. So that's pretty significant growth. Um, you don't need to probably aren't interested in reading every word here, um, but we have a, a record number of crop protection, that's the chemical side of advancements in our pipeline. And here are some investments that we've made to advance our crop strategy, 
including uh, Royal Berenberg Group for forages. That's another thing that we do besides row crops, besides um, professional pest, we also do forage and uh, including alfalfa. So currently we are launching and ramping up our newest insecticide called sulfoxiflor. It's for sucking um, insect pests. We also are um, continuing to ramp up our refuge advanced uh, product, our seeds, uh, where we've got 5% blended refuge in the bag, which is a really popular option for um, farmers where they don't have to plant dedicated refuge, but the refuge is in the bag. Uh, we've got a new uh, trait solution in, in Latin America called PowerCore for above ground pests in corn um, and herbicide tolerance as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Enlist um, in just a second uh, because that's something that we're very excited about is Enlist. Uh, we've, I thought you guys might be interested to know that we also are in the oilseed business and we're working on healthier oils um, for people. Uh, and uh, for commercial uh, food preparation as well as, as, well as uh, home use. Uh, and of course, I can't not talk about termite control. Um, since we're talking about termite baits today, we've got the Centricon colony elimination system <coughs> for termite control. Here is our uh, crop protection pipeline today. Uh, this is what our uh, shows what we are getting ready to launch um, in the within five years of now and then what will be launched sometime after that these uh, these a lot of these are code coded um, because they're super secret um, but they're like novel delivery system that's a formulation enhancement and then we've got broadleaf herbicides fungicides and other herbicides so I was mentioning we've got this brand new insecticide sulfoxiflor that we started launching last year and will uh, continue to launch through this year. From a chemical side, part of our Enlist system, which is our, our trade, uh, traded um, corn, beans, and cotton, we also have a, a proprietary formulation of 2,4-D that goes along with that um, uh, as well. So we've got that that is going to be launching in 13 and 14. And then you can see a variety of other uh, novel delivery systems, insecticides, fungicides, uh, the products that we end up getting in the professional pest management build it, uh, professional pest management business will be some of these that are leveraged over. This is what our biotech pipeline looks like. Like I said, we're excited about uh, Enlist that we'll be launching later this year um, and into next year. We've got oils. Um, each of these trait where we're, it says that there's a trait solution along here. Um, many times that's that's more than one gene that's multiple genes you know six seven eight genes that we're stacking in a in a seed um, currently in the market today we've got smart stacks we talked about the fact that we've advanced uh, to refuge in a bag and power core in Latin America and this corn is due to launch this year um, and then we've got beans and cotton following closely behind why do we have Enlist? Well, because of glyphosate resistant weeds, mostly. 50% of the farmers in the US uh, report that they have glyphosate resistant weeds on their, on their farms. And so the Enlist um, is uh, 2,4-D and FOP tolerant. And uh, it's not only in the US that resist glyphosate resistant weeds are a problem, but also in Latin America, very widespread resistance. And that just, again, shows the launch timeline. Said I wanted to talk a little bit about our seed or our oil seed business. We've got uh, canola and sunflowers. We're dedicated to um, trying to improve the healthiness of oils. Uh, currently, we already sell omega-9 oils into uh, food service. So maybe your french fries are being fried in a healthier oil now than they used to be. Not that french fries are ever healthy, but healthier than they healthier than they could be. Um, so we've got uh, oils, we've got enhanced canola meal for improved digestibility in livestock and uh, oils that have uh, omega-3 DHA, very healthy oils um, in, both, in both crop lines. Finally, my last uh, little bit of propaganda about Dow Agrosciences here, we've uh, grown in R&D tremendously um, over the last 
several years, not only in um, square footage of research space, but our investment, the investment that we get from our parent company, Dow, and the number of people that we employ. So you can see that we've got you know, an increase in square footage. We just dedicated, you may have seen on the news a week or two ago, a brand new R&D building um, in Indianapolis on our, in our campus there. Lots of new greenhouses, lots of new field stations as well. So making a lot of investments um, to grow our business. Okay. So that's a little bit about the company that I work for. Um, I did talk about this a little bit, and Gary, thank you for the, the nice introduction. I started out as, in uh, urban pest management in California. I uh, have been involved off and on with pest management most of my career. Moved to Indianapolis in 1996, and I've been here ever since in Indiana. Um, I've had a number of different roles since then in training, commercial. I did a stint in Six Sigma. We had people fully dedicated to doing Six Sigma. Um, R&D communications and strategy development. Most recently, I've moved into almost full-time people leadership. And so I have been doing a lot of people leadership in the ag chem business. I supervise pest management field people as well as range and pasture and TNO kind of people. Um, and then just a few months ago, have moved over into trait discovery and so that's where I'm sitting now is looking at new uh, developing new traits for corn um, if you're a if you are a student you're getting a great Purdue ec education along with excellent science skills and, le and leadership experience is something that's really important um, Gary mentioned that I've been active in ESA. I've been active in ESA a long time. I forget the last pen I got was really embarrassing. It was like 35 years or something ridiculous like that. Um, I couldn't believe I'd been active in the society that long. But it has given it gives you opportunities for leadership, and that's that's what I th think is very. Um, positive for, for students in particular. Um, any experience that you have with it that shows initiative, teamwork, flexibility, or that you're just curious and enthusiastic. Um, so a little pitch for your um, graduate student associations here on campus, any kind of opportunities you have to work there, as well as um, a pitch for uh, volunteering in your society. All right, subject in hand. Development of baiting as a, as a method to control subterranean termites. Most of this talk I pulled together for um, the International Congress on Entomology, which was last year um, in Korea. So it's about a year, a year old. I did look to update the slides. Um, I'm not sure that a whole lot has changed in the field of termite baiting in the last year because it seemed like it was pretty timely still. Back in the 1960s is when the, the idea of baiting for termites first emerged. The uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and U.S. Forest Products Lab first started working with wood uh, blocks that were dipped in Myrex. And I put in quotes here, to suppress relatively large pop pockets of infestation. Um, the, uh, this is Essenther uh, and Gray, and these guys did really the, the groundbreaking work on uh, termite on termite baiting. Um, the wood that they used in those studies was fungal decayed to 30 percent weight loss by a brown rot fungus. Um, and they in this work demonstrated utility for in their in their field plots in Mississippi. They also demonstrated utility on reticular termites in Ontario, Canada in 1966. And that study was published in 1968. So this was the very beginning of uh, termite baiting work. What they showed was pretty interesting. Um, this slide indicates that there were um, 362 units, these wood, decayed wood block units installed uh, in the in the Myrex plot, okay. Along with those were 359 untreated units. Now this is important, and we'll talk about the principles of termite baiting research here in a minute, because in order to show that the termite um, bait is having some activity, you've got to have some untreated some untreated blocks for the termites to feed on. Otherwise, it just looks like the termites don't like the, the bait that you've put out there. In the check plot, they had 365 units. If they went back in two months and looked, um, you can see that the activity is still pretty high in all of the units in both 
treated plot in, in both plots. Um, but by four months, you see a dramatic decline in the termite activity in the treated area in both the treated blocks and the untreated blocks as well. And by 12 months, you can see that there was, the, there was a pretty dramatic difference between the areas that were treated with Myrex and the areas that weren't. A follow-up study in Mississippi in 1968 used similar methods, except the Myrex was uh, pressure impregnated into the wood blocks instead of just being dipped. This study confirmed that the treatment suppressed the termite activity to very low levels for two years and had residual effectiveness for a third year. So one application was able to suppress the activity for a long period of time. Also, they showed insecticidal bait affected colonies in nearby untreated areas despite buffer areas that were in between the treated and untreated zones. So what it's showing is that it's having a, a, a broad impact on, uh, on colonies in the area. Then a third study was conducted in an urban environment with positive results and another study on top of that by these same, kind of the same group of people simulated building protection by treating uh, field plot perimeters. Okay, um, and then trying to use that to protect a wood block that was in the middle of the, the in the middle of the field plot. So even very early on they were, they were finding that they were going to they were thinking ahead to where we are actually today with controlling termites around buildings. So here are the principles that I, I talked to you about. The, these are very important um, for termite baiting research. First off, and this was established right up front, that you've got to have untreated monitors in the study. You can't just treat everything. Uh, you have to have the untreated monitors to, to demonstrate that your, um, th your bait isn't simply repellent. They said that Myrex was a slow-acting poison requiring 12 to 24 hours to affect the termites. So again, they've established right here this principle that you need a very slow-acting toxicant in order to affect a colony of social insects. Myrex formulation used did not deter the termites, so you've got to have something that's palatable for the termites. It, it has to be something that they're not going to detect and avoid. And finally, um, colony territory delineation as an important criter evaluation criterion was later supported by Sue and Chaffron. So um, again, the idea that uh, knowing where, because it's a, it's, a, it's a cryptic insect, you can't see where the colony is located unless you dig it up, just you destruct, destroy the colony. Um, being able to try to connect the areas where the termites are coming to the surface is really um, important in order to establish efficacy of the termite bait. So uh, subsequent to those very early studies by Essenther and Gray and USDA, um, termite bait research has focused on active ingredients and a variety of active ingredients that are available. Bait matrices, so that's the other aspect. You can't just have a good active ingredient. You also have to have a good bait that the termites are, are going to consume. Um, the physical aspects of the baiting is also are important. The bait stations themselves, the monitors, if there's going to be monitors in addition to bait, um, where you put the bait station, and how often you inspect the baits. So all of these things have been investigated in research. Feeding stimulants and attractants, you know, the idea of, okay, so they like the bait okay, can we make it any better, or could we mask a, uh, maybe a bait that they didn't like as well. Um, and then, there, of course, there, there's, there have been studies on the commercial product itself, not just the individual components in isolation, but the commercial product itself. Um, we have to do studies to support registration. There are studies that have to go into labeling. And then um, in order to provide good instructions for people, the practitioners using the termite bait, uh, there's uh, studies that go into that as well and work. So I'm going to uh, talk about each one of these things, um, each one of these aspects in turn, and give you an idea of the research that have been done, that's been done in each of those areas. Um, so my work seemed to work pretty well. However, all pesticide uses of Myrex were canceled by the US EPA in 1978. It's chlorinated hydrocarbon known to bioaccumulate. Not such a cool thing to be using in the field. Um, 
many alternatives have been tested in the lab in the field. And when I went back to the literature, I was actually kind of surprised at how many things have been tested over time. In my mind, I was thinking there was just this huge lull because we had another chlorinated hydrocarbon that was a really successful termiticide. We also had a, um, we also had chlorpyrifos that was a very successful uh, liquid termiticide as well. But even while we had those products in the marketplace, there was continued activity going on with, uh, termite bait active ingredients. Um, most, of the, most of the trials, but not all, all of them, used rhinotermitted species. So talking about active ingredients that have been investigated for termite baits, the, here's a laundry list of what I was able to find. Um, juvenile hormone mimics have been used. Uh, lots of chitin synthesis inhibitors, and by and large, most of the commercial products, I think, except save one today, uses uh, a chitin synthesis inhibitor. Um, but then also other modes of action have been investigated as well. Fipronil has been at, and looked at. Um, boric acid, abamectin, uh, sulfuramid, that's, another, that's a, an active ingredient actually in a commercial product. Uh, other chemistries, nematodes have been looked at as a bait active ingredient. And I was interested to know that uh, bacteria, both conventional and transgenic bacteria, have been investigated as a termite bait active ingredient as well. Insect growth regulators were suggested by about 1984 as a, as a potential um, bait active ingredient. Uh, juvenile hormone mimics uh, have been investigated fairly thoroughly. In general, they induced inner casts and pre-soldiers, but not necessarily um, uniform mortality across different termite species. So they haven't really been exploited in a commercial way. Results of chitin synthesis inhibitors depended on the compound and the termite species. So with even the CSIs, with similar modes of action, um, each one needed to be investigated to let, check for intrinsic activity and then termite acceptance across a number of different species. Hexaflumeron was the first chitin synthesis inhibitor commercialized. It was by Dow, and that was done in 1995. So talking about a little bit about deterrence, here's an example of one of the studies that was, that was done by Sue and Sheffron <coughs> in 96, showing deterrence when they detected deterrence to these different chitin synthesis inhibitors and how that can vary by species. So you could see that uh, flavapes, um, in that species, hexaflumeron deterrence was detected at about 8,000 parts per million. Formosans would eat a lot more of it before they detected any deterrence. Um, with the uh, lufenuron flavapes, de de there were detected deterrence at 100 parts per million. So very, very little um, and much, much greater uh, lufenuron uh, to get deterrence with the uh, Formosan termite. Looking at mortality, um, I've got an example here of some research that was done. This was done by a couple of Dow people. Um, with the treatments being a quarter percent diflubenzeron and a half percent diflubenzeron and then a half percent novoflumeron. These are flavapes again, uh, native subterranean termites. And this table shows the number of surviving termites out of 100. And you can see that uh, the, the dose really makes a big difference with diflubenzeron. Um, not getting uh, significant activity until uh, uh, four weeks after, ap uh, after exposure, and then um, a little bit better activity with novoflumeron. Uh, by six weeks exposure, you know, still not very good activity with the diflubenzeron and, and, and better activity uh, with, the, with the novoflumeron. So other modes of action, at least thus far, have been less successful termite bait candidates. And a uh, quote by um, Grace uh, et al. in 2000, um, C. formosanus exhibited a de decrease in activity by the second day of exposure to sulfuramid. Okay, so there was only one bait that used sulfuramid, and I don't think, that if they're still using sulfuramid, um, I think they're looking for probably a chitin synthesis inhibitor because there are some challenges with using uh, uh, a stomach poison for um, a termite bait. Um, clearly, you don't want a termite to get sick. 
and um, associate getting sick with the with the, the toxicant. You don't want a termite to die in or near the toxicant because then they start associating the the bait with uh, lethal effects. And termites are pretty smart at avoiding things like that. <coughs> So that's it on um, active ingredient development. If we look at bait matrices, that's the other essential component to a good termite bait, is a good termite bait matrix. The attributes that are desired there are um, that they can be uniformly manufactured. You gotta think practically if it's a commercial product. You have to be able to source the, the um, components of the bait, you need to be able to manufacture them, and you need it to turn out the same every single time um, if you're going to sell this product. It needs to be palatable. Okay, If you make a really uniformly manufactured bait that's cheap um, to produce and it's not tasty, it's not going to get uh, termites to eat it. Some level of durability is required. And it should be inexpensive because you're, you're making a lot of these things. Um, wood does actually not meet all those needs from a manufacturing standpoint. It's hard to get to, it's hard to get a toxicant into the into wood um, in a uniform way, um, and it's not necessarily uniform. We uh, you can source different wood from different parts of the country, and termites are going to like it differently. Uh, nor do cardboard, paper, sawdust, etc. In uh, 2001, USDA ARS published research on a nutritionally enhanced matrix formulated to closely resemble the chemical composition of highly preferred wood species infected by wood decaying fun fungi. Um, and in 2007, Nan Yao Su published a study on hermetically sealed baits for subterranean termites, um, look at which evidence to search for improved longevity of the bait. So you can see that, that uh, there have been efforts that have gone into um, developing a good termite bait matrix. Not everybody has published on this, however. Manufacturers in particular um, will tend to keep their bait matrix components, the uh, secret recipe, secret. In general, though, I can tell you that today, compressed purified cellulose is the most common um, kind of, of uh, termite bait <coughs> that contains a toxicant. Um, what else is in that, I, I can't tell you, the, because manufacturers don't reveal it. But by and large, uh, the, the primary component is compressed and purified cellulose of different forms. Um, Recruit HD termite bait is new. This is the newest bait that we've got on the market. It's a composite that improves durability. And I've got a, I brought a little show and tell. It's back there on the table if you want to look at it when I'm done um, with my talk um, to show you what, what we've done to improve the durability of the bait. We started out, back when I first started with the company, we first started looking at termite baits. This what it, that's sawdust. That's what we started with. We thought termites like wood. They're infesting buildings. Sawdust, that would be awesome. Awesome. But termites don't actually like that very much. Um, we tried paper. They like paper a lot, uh, but it's not very durable. You know, it doesn't last very long in the ground. Uh, they, they, termites really like purified cellulose, and that's what's in this termite uh, bait matrix here, is it's compressed purified cellulose, um, which is the same thing in a different form, I think, that's in the uh, in, in a competitive product to Dagger Sciences Advance by BASF now. Um, I think that's Advance. And then uh, the, this is an example of uh, Recruit HD that's been fed on by termites. And that is a, a composite material. It's hard as this table, but termites seem to really love it. OK, next on the list was bait stations and uh, monitoring. Uh, what kind of research has been done on those components of a termite baiting system? Following others' publications on termite traps, of course termite researchers have been trying to trap termites for a long time and in various, in various um, configurations they've come up with. Susan Jones used toilet paper in the desert, toilet paper rolls on the surface of the desert in, uh, in Arizona when she was with the USDA. Um, people use PVC pipes with uh, wood or cardboard in them. Um, and they have for a long time. Uh, but a bait container was described by French and Robinson in 1985 as a method for screening baits. 
Okay, so they went from collecting termites in a, in a station to screening baits in a station. And, um, and then additional work was done. Okay, well, if you can screen baits in a station, maybe we can sell baits in a station. And so um, that work uh, continued. Uh, monitoring and testing stations then evolved to house termite baits. These serve a couple of purposes. Why don't you just put the, serve, the, the bait in the ground? Well, it helps keep the bait protected. It avoids disturbance, um, so you're not digging up the soil every time you want to look at your termite bait. Uh, provides a means of location, so it's easier to find if it's not buried, if, it's, if there's something obvious that you're looking for. Um, we want it to have, be easy to manufacture and use and uh, effective in practice. An above ground station was described by Sue et al. in 1996 as a technique for monitoring termite populations and at, at that time he also suggested that that would be um, have a potential for delivering bait to termite colonies above ground not just um, below the soil surface. Today with, the, with Recruit HD, the durable bait that, that we have in our bait system, you can put the bait in the station from the first day you put the station in the ground. We didn't used to have that ability because we were using paper or purified cellulose as the bait. If you put that in the ground within 30 days, certainly within 60, that would be degraded and no longer attractive to the termites. So um, at that time what we would do is start with a wood monitor and then uh, replace the wood monitor with the bait material the, with the active ingredient in it um, when the termites were infesting the station. So yes, there was research that went into the monitor composition as well. Uh, several studies were published on understanding termite preference for different wood species. So we were trying to figure out what's going to be the best termite bait monitor out there. Um, species, geography, season, all impact preference. If you, get, if you try to get two um, find a wood species that's really super attractive, likely it's only going to be attractive to a limited number of, of termite species. So um, generally, uh, southern yellow pine, ash, aspen species, generally acceptable across a broad range of termite species. Um, pr you know, practical considerations of relative um, ready availability and cost are also important. So if you have a termite that, you know, feeds on only some or it really loves only one particular rare species of wood, that you're probably not going to pick that as a manufacturer to go into your, into your product. So when monitors are used, it's generally going to be one of these in here. Okay, so what have we covered so far? What components of the bait system have we covered so far? I'm going to see if anybody's listening. Active ingredient. Active ingredient. Good. The matrix. The matrix. Excellent. Monitoring. Sorry? Monitoring the... The monitoring device. Good. And there's one other thing. What the bait goes in. The station. We talked about that, didn't we? Okay. Um, station placement is the, is the next thing that, that we have done research on. It's a lot of work, isn't it, to develop a termite baiting system. It's not a trivial exercise. So station placement has been looked at. Research indicated that installing stations in conducive areas or areas where termites are found might maximize interception with termites. Well, duh. That kind of seems like a, an obvious thing. But um, it's hard when you're talking to a pest control company to say only put the termite stations where you find the termites because a lot of times there are termites present and you don't find them. So to labels today incorporate both standard interval placement and what we say with our product is about every 10 feet around the structure and placement at conducive or active conditions. So if you see an area where there's a lot of moisture or firewood or a fence or that's infested or something like that, you want to put the stations there. Um, consistent with this finding was a suggestion that the use of auxiliary stations increases bait consumption. So if you've got termites infesting this station right here, if you plop another station right next to it, chances are very good that you're going to get termites in that station as well. What this figure shows is how we do um, some of our efficacy research in the field. Uh, each one of these 
round stations would be uh, a monitoring station, and then each of the uh, pen pen Pentagon ones um, are the uh, durable bait. So when we did our research for Recruit HD, uh, we had a number of monitoring stations that were unbaited, and then we had our bait, our, our, the stations containing our bait in between. So remember those principles from earlier. You've got to have unbaited, you've got to have unbaited stations in order to monitor what's happening with the termite uh, population in that area. All right, so where you put the station is important. How often you look at the station is also important. Who is that important to? That is really important to your customer. Because it costs a whole lot more to send somebody back to the house to look at the station every month than it does every quarter. And it costs more to send somebody there every quarter than it does to send them there every year. And so to the, our customer, who's the pest control company, that is a really important question. So it's dependent on efficacy research data to support the registration, as well as durability and volume of the monitors of the bait matrix combined with the potency of the active ingredient. So you gotta balance those things out in order to figure out how long you can go in between inspecting the stations. It ranges in commercial products today from monthly to annually. As far as I know, we're the only, agri Dow AgriSciences is the only one with an annually monitored system today. Um, Eager et al. published research conducted on 122 termite colonies to support our transition from going from monthly to quarterly monitoring with recruit bait. Okay. 122 different stations. And, you know, we don't do all that ourselves. We, we use university cooperators, um, collaboration from, um, from uh, contractors, etc. Remember we talked about attractants and feeding stimulants. Well, if our bait's good, maybe we can make it even better. Folks have been looking for um, opportunities to improve the palatability of the bait. Uh, wood rot fungi were first identified as a factor in termite feeding in 1961. I mean, that was a long time ago. We've known that. Researchers more recently suggested then, well, maybe fungal extracts could be used as feeding stimulants for termite baiting systems. Um, additionally, phagostimulants such as hydroquinone and various sugars and amino acids have also been um, suggested as enhancements. We found, for instance, with uh, when we were using the uh, paper uh, for our bait matrix, in certain parts of the country, termites were kind of finicky. They didn't like the paper so much. And uh, we, we found that if we wetted the paper with Gatorade, the termites liked it a lot better. This was like in Arizona and areas like that. If they, they like the Gatorade. They like the components in Gatorade. Uh, Summon is a, is a product that I'm not sure the FMC makes it anymore, but it's a, it's a product that where they've published some efficacy work. Um, the effects of the Summon on feeding, tunneling, and bait station discovery, but they have not published what it actually is. So it's still a mystery. Um, and then CO2 uh, producing compounds also have been investigated and patented and here's an example of a product that uh, is a CO2 generating material. And I think it is um, corn grit maybe or, or it's something that ferments in the ground and so it produces CO2 and, and termites are attracted to that. Okay, winding up here, I've got uh, current professional termite bait products as of about a year ago listed here on this, um, on this slide. You can see that there are a number of products commercialized. Like I said, most of these have a CSI, active ingredient, a chitin synthesis inhibitor. Most of them used a, use a, uh, a purified cellulose uh, material for a bait matrix. So a little bit of review. Remember the principles that we talked about before. Publish research on development of the commercial product. If you're gonna do um, work on the, the commercial product itself, we, I feel strongly that you've gotta use untreated monitors, that you've gotta make sure that you've got a slow acting active ingredient, that it does not deter the termites, and that you're doing some kind of colony delineation in order to say that you really have 
gotten rid of the, the a colony of termites and not just the termites in some little area. So if you have connected the populations that are infesting distant monitors, you bait this mon you bait this this colony over here, you and you know that this part over here is connected, you want to see this one go away too, right? So when you look at the published research on commercial products, we've got a fairly lengthy bibliography on uh, Centricon-related research. And there is also some research on um, competitive products as well. Uh, for First Line or Terminate, which use, uses sulfluramid, uh, a number of people have done research with that product. Um, this trifluron is a, a product, I think it's by, it's Sumitomo. Um, the Exterm product is, is from Sumitomo, and there's been some work on that as well. Um, and then on uh, chlorofluorazuron and uh, lufenuron as well. And I'm thinking bistrifluron, let me see. No, it's novaluron. Um, as far as new, okay. So anyway, it's good to have published research I've, uh, on, on your actual commercial product. As far as what's new in the market, um, we launched a, uh, a new, act, same active ingredient, new, new matrix in 2011 um, with Recruit HD termite bait uh, with an annual monitoring interval. And then BASF recently registered a new uh, uh, chitin synthesis inhibitor, Novaluron. I think they say Novaluron. Um, and are calling it Trelona, but I haven't seen it yet in the market. I don't know if they've made the change from diflubenzeron yet to a new, um, to a new active ingredient. And then bistrifluron, uh, which is Exterm and Sumitomo has that in the market. I don't believe here in the U.S., but outside the U.S. So we've covered a lot of ground in, uh, in 50 years, and we've covered a lot of ground in here today. Um, this process has, has been going on uh, for a long time, investigating active ingredients, the bait matrix that the active goes in, stations, monitors, placement, and monitoring intervals, feeding stimulants and attractants, and whether they have utility, and finally, um, research on the commercial product as well to get us to where we are today. So the question is, have we reached the pinnacle in termite control now? Um, if you've got any questions on, you know, market share and that kind of stuff, baits versus other methods of control, I have, I have a little bit of that um, knowledge. Um, but we feel like we've, we've come a long way in, in termite bait development. We think we've got pretty effective termite baits. And so the question is, if we reach the, the very top, can we do any better? And I'm thinking probably we're not quite at the top yet in having the ultimate termite control. Um, this is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, Ju Juangsan National Park in uh, South Korea. Like I said, the presentation was first developed for that, for that meeting in Korea. And um, with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention today.